Right. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Gina Canella and this is Lynn Doncaster. We'll be talking about the state of local news and just kind of framing the discussion for what we'll be talking about today. And I just wanted to kind of read off a quick agenda for um, what's to come. So we'll, we'll be talking for about 30 minutes, about 15 minutes each. I'll be talking about more of an overview, kind of a national perspective around what's going on in journalism today. And Lynn will be talking about local level here in Somerville, what's happening with um, journalism. And then Jane Regan is going to introduce uh, breakout sessions in, uh, after us, and then we'll talk about headlines we've never seen, report backs from each groups, and then Leanne Fan um, will um, talk about the survey that we're doing to understand what your news needs are as summer billions and how we can meet them with the garden. Um, and then after that, we'll conclude and wrap up and do some informal networking. So just wanted to thank everyone for coming out today and um, just acknowledge the news gardeners, the volunteers, if you could raise your hand or stand if you're able, um, just so people know who you are. Um, and these are the people that really have been working on this project for the past couple months, I guess since um, mid-summer to get this going. Um, and so why are we doing the Somerville News Garden? So I'll be talking about the no news part of this title. Why is there not quite no news, but why are we sliding further and further into a potential news desert, which is a term that academics have uh, coined um, to talk about the, um, the erosion of local journalism in uh, most cities in the US. Um, oh, thanks. thanks. Um, so three, I think, key points to look at here in terms of the challenges for local journalism is the media consolidation, the economics of news, and the politi political economy of journalism. So um, ownership, who owns the local papers where you live, um, it's more and more a smaller and smaller group of huge conglomerates. So to kind of go back and give you some historical perspective, in the mid 20th century, newspapers were, were kind of booming. They were mostly in chains, and then they sort of went to um, a conglomerate, public-owned approach. And so the um, profit rates for newspapers at the time was around 30 to 40 percent, which is incredible. I mean, if you look at an industry like um, grocery stores, you're talking about single digits. So the profit margins was incredible, and everybody was thinking this this will last forever. Um, they had they took on a lot of debt in terms of buying up other papers because they felt like that model would continue. Um, then they got bigger and slower. So they were slower to um, innovate, to change when new technologies came along. They were sort of entrenched in that old model because it was so profitable um, for so long. And so when you look at, you know, Somerville, and when we'll talk more about this specifically, you have the gatehouse Gannett merger. And so what, what happens then is what's called a death spiral. And other industries have experienced similar things. You look at public transportation. Um, investment is not made. Um, investment is actually cut in providing resources. So fewer people use the service and um, <coughs> funding goes down because you have fewer paying customers and then the service gets worse, people have less incentive to contribute to it. The same kind of thing happens with newspapers. So you have these conglomerates that buy up local newspapers, they cut the newsroom as much as possible. Um, there's less staff, so there's less coverage. People that were subscribers were you know, committed to um, contributing to the newspaper are not doing so because they don't see coverage that seems relevant to them. So why am I going to pot buy a, a product that isn't um, serving me. And so then it just kind of creates this spiral that gets worse and worse and the coverage kind of continues to deteriorate and that's kind of the situation we have now. And then the next is uh, digital media. And so people talk about technology. Technology has killed local journalism, but it really is a, a sort of, it's at the media consolidation, ownership, digital media, and um, the algorithm. So you can't kind of blame one without the other. They're all very much interlinked. And so this kind of gets to distribution, subscriptions, and scale. So local news and local journalism doesn't have the same kind of scale that other national, international um, publications have. So news publications that are being successful now, I would say the New York Times, Washington Post, um, The Guardian, they cover things from a national perspective, national politics, kind of cultural topics, and that seems to attract a large audience. When it comes to um, local politics, city council, school board meetings, that's a small audience, and you can't necessarily get people in Iowa to care about 
um, what's going on in terms of uh, infrastructure development in Somerville. It's not really, it's kind of backyard um, politics. And then the next point is audiences. So kind of us, how we're kind of it, you know complicit in some ways in this, but also we're being led into different kinds of coverage by algorithms, um, silos, and engagements. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about the media consolidation. Um, so this is kind of what um, the chart looks like if you want to look at sort of the big players. And it's sort of changing um, all the time because um, these companies get bigger and bigger. So Disney is sort of a big player in this. So they own ESPN, um, ABC, um, Marvel. You know, they, they, it's like hard to keep track of what, what's like in their sort of purview. Star Wars. So this kind of matters because when you look at things like ABC News, Good Morning America, they'll have on when the new Star Wars is about to come out, all of the characters from the film to do promotion. So you get this kind of cross promotion. When it, when it comes to NBC Comcast, that's a vertical integration. So they own the production, the studios, the news, um, and the pipes that brings that content to you. So, you know, most places you only have one choice. Where I am, I can only get my internet through Comcast. And so, um, when you talk about net neutrality and these kinds of questions, if they're slowing down other competing content speed, like Netflix, for example, there was a notorious case where Comcast was actually doing this, it's in their interest because they want you, if that content is slow, they want you to, um, engage with NBC products. And um, it's just a bad um, situation for consumers because it means less choice and, um, yeah, poor service. Um, okay. And so then, you know, what this looks like in, in terms of newspapers and staff, I've kind of already mentioned this briefly, but um, just to kind of give you some statistics, according to a study from Pew from 2008 to 2018, the number of newspaper reporters dropped 47%. And then some um, estimates, talking specifically here about Somerville in the Gatehouse Gannett merger, the company's co combined workforce will be about 20, 25,000 people. And if 10% of that workforce is cut, that could be 2,500 people, which is just shy of the 3,000 employees with McClatchy, which is the second largest um, newspaper chain. So it's kind of looking at potentially losing uh, the second largest newspaper conglomerate if this merger happens and these estimates kind of go through. Um, so the numbers are pretty stark and the charts, you know, kind of bear this out in terms of um, employment and revenue. Um, another study from Pointers showed that two thirds of counties in America now have no daily newspaper. Again, the news desert and 1300 communities have lost all local coverage. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about here in terms of the golden age of newspapers. So you see this, you know, climb further and further up with advertising revenues and the commercial model was really successful until around 2000. And then it's the, oh my God, cliff kind of falling off, uh, digital and print also kind of being part of this. And then when you look at technology being part of this, um, you know, it kind of came on a little bit later. So when you blame Google, Facebook, um, for kind of sucking up the revenue. Yes, they are part of it and they are sort of um, going in the opposite direction, but the slide happened prior to these platforms kind of really taking on their dominance in the market space. Um, so, okay, digital revenue and the problem of scale. So social media, how is this related to um, the problem with local news or the loss and the erosion of local news coverage? Um, Craigslist is often um, cited as one reason why um, newspapers have lost a lot of revenue. Um, so, you know, previously in a mid-market uh, newspaper, they could charge $500 for a classified ad for a newspaper. So again, it gets to the ownership question and the greed. Um, so when you're sort of, a, you have that kind of like market power and you're charging these exorbitant rates and something comes along that's free, can you really blame users and consumers for using these products? I mean, the good thing about Craig Newmark, not to put so much blame on him, he is really passionate about local news. His name is actually on the uh, journalism school at the um, CUNY Graduate School. And so he's trying to sort of try to, you know, think about ways to contribute um, back into local journalism. Um, and so what happens when these um, digital platforms like Google, Facebook have this kind of power? 
they're able to sort of redirect news organizations and um, change their algorithms uh, and dictate what kind of traffic gets to um, the publisher. So the publishers that are reliant on um, advertising and run on a commercial model um, are sort of tied to these changes. And if, they're, if Google or Facebook doesn't like what they're doing, they can change the news feed and they can change what gets privileged in people's um, news feed. And then the content doesn't get to the end users. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea, to say, you know, we'll get off Facebook or news publishers should not use Facebook as a strategic um, distribution outlet, 50% of people report getting their news from Facebook. So there's a huge audience there that um, newspapers and publishers are trying to reach. So to avoid that is tough, but then um, you have charts like this to show that, you know, publishers are in this tricky position in terms of their traffic. Um, and this is just another chart to look at how Facebook um, was promoting instant articles and then when it decided to change course, um, outlets like the New York Times, Vox, and others, you know, their um, traffic dropped off a cliff. And, you know, so when Facebook has this kind of power to really crush uh, publications that are reliant on revenue, I think that is a huge problem and part of what we're trying to talk about here. Um, and then finally, the filter bubbles and audience. So this kind of gets to the question of your news diet and being a really conscientious news consumer. So trying to go outside of your typical, um, your bubble that gets created by these algorithms. So if you're using Facebook like most people to get your news or Twitter or social media or Google, um, all of these platforms are sort of linked. They're tracking you across with cookies and other sorts of, you know, um, techniques. So you're, they're giving you content that they think you will like. So to get out of that and to find things that don't confirm your already held beliefs and your biases, it's difficult. And it takes work on our parts as audiences and consumers of news um, to find that content. So it is kind of, I think there is a little bit of an onus on us, but I think it's also important to recognize that there are these um, surveillance apparatuses and um, sort of targeted um, sort of techniques that are being used by these big tech platforms that are giving us a pretty unhealthy news diet. Um, so the, just to kind of quick recap the big three, I think, points to get at here in terms of why local news coverage has been declining and is, it in, is in the position that it's in, is the consolidation of media and ownership, um, the politi political economy of news and the model, so the commercial model, for-profit, non-profit, um, member-led, foundation-funded. You know, people are testing different options here in terms of ownership, co-op models for news if the journalists are owning the actual publication, that gives them more incentive to sort of um, control what actually gets put onto the site. Um, and then technology, digital media, moving online since roughly around, you know, the late 90s, but really ramping up around the early 2000s, 2005, and, and beyond, and what that's done to um, news organizations that were slow to adapt, and then what, uh, um, what these platforms are doing to dictate the kind of news that gets to us through these kinds of filtering and algorithms and siloing. Um, so with that, I'll kind of give it to Lynn to talk about what's happening here locally or what's been happening here historically. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So, uh, no. Do this at me. Oh, that's okay. okay. <clears throat> Sorry. So when the question came up, what's happening nationally? I wanted to ask, well, what has happened here locally? So I volunteered to go through some back issues of the Somerville Journal, mostly looking at that golden age of media, 1970 to present. And I will say what I have here is not a comprehensive overview or a scientific survey. I'm just someone who really likes to sit in front of microfilm. So next one. Somerville Journal uh, began in 1970, I'm sorry, began in 1870. It changed owners a number of times, but we're going to focus on 1970 to the present, when it was owned by Dole Publishing, which was local and had three papers. Then the Community News Corporation, which was owned by Fidelity and had many more outlets, and now it's ownership by Gateway Media. Uh, I did page counts of 
the issues from the last week of September for every five years since 1970, thinking that maybe page counts would give us an idea of what healthy media looked like. Um, if you'll see that spike in 2005 where the paper had something like 57 pages in that issue, but when I went through it, 22 of those pages were classified ads or full page ads for automobiles, mm -hmm. which isn't really exciting or interesting reading and doesn't tell you much about what's going on your, in your community. So the page counts might not be giving us the full story. Let's go to the next one. I have to thank uh, Edward Nealon of the of Dole Publishing, who in 1970 put the readership stats for the Somerville Journal in their advertising. And in 1970, 83.6% of the households in Somerville were getting the Somerville Journal. There's no media outlet that has that kind of reach, let alone a small media outlet. Uh, what year was that? 1970. Uh, well, 1970, I think maybe in the next, not in the next slide. Um, 1970, <coughs> things were delivered. Yes, we have the oh, Newsboys delivered. Picnic. Oh, and yeah, so the, you know, th these days are long gone, but you had kids delivering the newspaper, which increases their involvement in the community, their engagement with the paper. And if we go to the next slide, uh, this is another 1970 ad from Dole Publishing that lists all of their employees. They had 48 employees for three newspapers. Now, it's a, a number of these are going to be classified ads, people who are doing layout, which you no know, longer is now done on computer, so you, you don't have typesetters. Uh, fewer people doing the local advertising pictures, which you'll see later. But still, 48 is pretty remarkable, and when I counted bylines in the paper, there were about <coughs> four reporters plus some community input. So the next one, here's our, our Newsboys picnic, and the next one, Topics we were talking about in 1970, just to give you an idea of what Somerville was like then, um, this is when 93 was being built. And one of the issues I looked at, uh, there was an incident where two kids died on a construction site at the 90, where Route 93 was being built. Over the course of three or four issues, they had over a dozen articles about these two kids. Perspective from the family, feedback from the construction, whoever was in charge of the construction about how those problems would be avoided. And, uh, an incident where the uh, city council meeting was in was interrupted by grieving families. Because there were so many reporters on the paper at the time, they were able to get really in-depth and look at the, the tragedy, the problem that caused it, and where it was coming from in the greater uh, regional perspective. So next. Here's 1975. Here are your candidates for Alderman at Large and School Committee. This is in September when it's the preliminaries. But if you look at the number here, there are so many more people running for office in 1975. Is this because we had more robust local media, more people involved in their media? Yeah. Let's go to the next. Uh, Dole Publishing stopped putting their readership ads it, putting their readership stats in the ads after 1970, so my job of researching this got a little bit harder. But in the 80s, when uh, Paperhead combined with a few others, it was now seven papers, uh, 221, 2,000 readers in seven towns, that breaks out to 31,600 per town. That's still a drop from what we had in the 70s. Next slide. And in the 80s, uh, we've seen I just threw this in to see what we were talking about in the 80s. Uh, the big pinball scandal, computers getting in schools. Next slide. When we get to the 90s, I have a little bit of a benefit with nepotism because my cousin was a reporter for the journal in the 90s. So I, was able to, I wasn't able to get readership stats, but I was able to get from him that at the time that he left the paper in 1996, they had two full-time reporters and one part-time reporter. He worked about 70 hours a week as a full-time reporter turned in about 17 stories a week, and his family of three qualified for food stamps. Uh, he left the paper <laughs> in 1996 because uh, he was just burnt out from it. Next slide. 
While he was there, he covered the crime log and the police reports, which if you were in Somerville in the 90s, it was an interesting time to cover crime. Yeah. Uh, and when we met, we talked a lot about this and how the, the crime log and the police log aren't always the most interesting. It's a list of vehicles vandalized, things are broken into. But when you see a police car on your street at 3 a.m., who do you go to to find out why that police car was there? Right now, we're going to Facebook, we're going to the store, we're just going to our neighbors to find out what the ambulance was for. <clears throat> you could go to the Somerville Journal, but they don't have as comprehensive a listing of the, the police reports and the, the crime log that they used to. Also, it means that they're not covering fun stories like this, like an iguana stuck in a tree, which is not really newsworthy, is it important that we know this? Or is it important that we know people in our community have iguanas? Is it important that we get to know more about the people in our community? Next. Also, uh, there used to be a lot more sports coverage in the Somerville Journal, thanks in large part to Joe Ruby, who worked at the high school and coordinated the sports coverage until he passed away. Uh, now sports coverage is cut down to one page, maybe less. Next slide. 1990s saw the introduction of Speak Out in the Somerville oh, yeah. Journal. Yeah, people are nodding. For those who don't know Speak Out, um, in the 90s, you could call the Somerville Journal and leave a voice message, which would be transcribed and printed in the paper the next week. So it was like really early Twitter. Um, and people called in for all kinds of things related to Somerville or not, you'll see the one about Korea's <laughs> border policy, <laughs> not to do with Somerville, with Somerville politics, and uh, you know the person who's looking for Dan Dan noodles. <laughs> We'd go to Facebook for that now. Uh, but this was really novel and exciting at the time, and maybe some teenagers prank called things in. I don't know for sure. Next slide. <laughs> Yes, it was anonymous. Yeah. Um, here's something else that used to be in the paper. 70s and 80s would take up two or three pages at a time. The society pages, we don't do this anymore. Like, yeah. Uh, th this, is, this belongs on your Facebook feed now. But it used to be an important part of keeping your community involved with your life, letting people know what was going on. Next slide. And the recipe pages. 70s and 80s, not something that would be in a newspaper now, necessarily. The New York Times has food coverage. But this gets into talk about who was buying the paper. And it was families buying the paper. And you go to the next slide. No, please go to the next slide. Uh, I, get, I start getting into advertising. And the ads that were in the paper really speak to the Through the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s, the ads were very much from local businesses and they were serving their local communities like families since Somerville was a working class city at the time families that were buying the paper just to get the specials so that they could plan their budgets plan their shopping next slide and a lot of coupons which I'm not going to argue that we should bring back coupons to the extreme couponing show but this is a way to get People going to their local businesses, showing the local businesses that people are paying attention to media, and uh, and just keeping that that ecosystem alive. Next page. This one just makes me laugh because um, it's terrible <laughs> advice, and it also it, it shows how the advertisers were working together and how businesses were working together. We have two shops both selling women's gear, <laughs> placing ads together. Next slide. More about who was buying the paper and what advertisers thought of their consumers. Next one. This is really interesting. Um, this comes from 1970, and this is an ad from a local church group that was trying to get kids not to hang out on the street. This was a, a time when people were really worried about youth gone wrong and street gangs and there's an article about Powderhouse Park which was a hotbed of activity for uh, drug dealing and just various ne'er doing ne'er good 
Near do wells. Near do wells. Thank you. Um, yeah, local advertisers speaking to the concerns of the local community. Next slide. Also, video store. I, I love ads for businesses that no longer exist. So I, I copied a lot of them, and I'm sorry to take up so much time. But video stores. Remember those? Next one. Also, yeah. Uh, I love these old ads because putting putting lo local businesses in print is something that we're losing with digital media. Uh, not just local ads, but everything going into print. We're, we're losing this record of who we are and what we care about. And also that Wingworks picture makes me salivate every time I see it because I miss the buffalo sandwich. Next well, slide. Uh, this one makes me laugh because obviously not, you got the wig wrong. Next slide. <laughs> I end on this one, um, and I'll read the whole thing to you. When you advertise in the journal press, you can be 99% confident that your ad will reach 57,791 customers. So they won't be driving, sleeping, or talking. Reading requires attention. With with getting our information on digital devices, how sure can we be that people aren't driving or talking or possibly even sleeping while they're looking at the news? Um, reading requires attention. So the question that we, we have now is how to get people's attention, how to keep them involved with local media, how to get the businesses to support local media so that we can have this healthy ecosystem. I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, we are very interested in learning what uh, and how people consume local media. Um, as a uh, recent transplant to Somerville, um, I feel like uh, the way that I consume media, the way that my peers uh, consume media may be different from other people's. And uh, I think that uh, knowing how people in Somerville consume media will uh, greatly inform how we, um, as the Somerville News Gallery, proceed with this project of um, creating a uh, new, uh, new appetite for community journalism. Um, and yeah, if you have your phone with you, please uh, either go to that uh, URL or that QR code. Um, it's only 20-ish uh, questions, and um, yeah, we would really like as much participation as possible, and please send it to um, to people you know, um, and yeah. So thank you all for coming out today. Uh, be sure to turn in your forms and let us know if and how you want to be involved with Somerville News Garden. Uh, stay, like us on Facebook, uh, like us yes. on Twitter. I think, I think that covers the social media. Uh, keep picking up the papers in the boxes. Um, Anything else? Yeah, there is a flyer. Um, so Jane Regan mentioned this in our group. I don't know if uh, it was talked about over here, but there's a flyer about a community journalism crash course. So if you want to um, learn about covering news, there's a 90-minute course um, with the Somerville Neighborhood News Coordinator, Jane Regan. She'll introduce participants to basics like how to find stories and sources, how to do interviews, verify facts, write a standard news, news story or press release. Um, so there are dates on the flyer. Um, one is Tuesday, November 12th from noon to 1.30, and then Thursday, November 14th, 7 to 8.30, so a couple weeks, and that's at Somerville Media Center in Union Square. So um, yeah, that's kind of part of what we're trying to do here is create a media school where we'll do some training and teach people how to kind of cover stories if they're not being covered or not covered, covered the way that you think they should be. Um, so this might be a good introduction to learning some of those skills. But yeah, we just want to thank our um, sponsors, Dig Boston, Binge, the Somerville Media Center, and the volunteers of the, the News Once Garden, Somerville. and Once Somerville for providing the space. So thank you again for coming, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you at another event soon. Yay. Thanks, guys.